First, I want to thank the organizers for uh, the invitation and also actually for suggest uh, the topic for the care code. And uh, definitely, you know, if you have a question, just stop me. I really uh, think that would be better. Uh, so I will talk about for the care codes and uh, from the point of view of topological phase of matter. Uh, so this is a joint work with uh, Dave Asen and Matt Hastings. It happened to be both here. And if you find it interesting after my talk, you should talk with them. They are much better than me as resources. And uh, so I don't think we have any theory of a flaky cause. It just barely started. Uh, we are still looking for examples. But still, uh, I want to give you kind of the dream picture I have in my mind, how this fits into the general theory of error crashing codes. And I believe all the audience are experts already because on Wednesday you have a crash course on error crashing code. So uh, I'll be talking very general term. So uh, if you think about the history of error crashing code, I would call the first kind of code invented by Peter Shaw as subspace code. What that means is that uh, you have a local Hilbert space, think about your spin degree freedom or whatever it is, and then you have a local Hamiltonian, and then you have a ground state. And I want my Hamiltonian to be local commuting projectors. And then uh, my code subspace would be the ground state. And uh, there are many, many examples. The most famous one probably is Tori code, but actually you can also prove mathematically just take the Kitaya quantum double model, the ground state will be error correction code. More exotically, take the level one model and the ground state will be also error correction code. And I think after Tori code, probably the most famous error code next one in theory would be hard code. And that's another example. So these are all subspace of a local Hilbert space. And then there's the next, I would call subsystem codes. And uh, the structure, uh, I don't know this is the same as you know, standard literature, but this is my way of formulate subsystem code because I want to uh, say that subspace code, subspace code is a subset of subsystem. Of course, I want to say subsystem is a subset for the kid. Of course, subset doesn't mean it's less important. It just means it's uh, more specialized. So the subsystem code, the structure mathematically is the following. So you have a subspace code. And this is a bunch of commuting projectors. And in the stabilizer case, it's just a bunch of commuting polys. So that form a group I call AH. So this is a billion group. And uh, then for the subsystem code, you are looking for a group extension. So this is group G, which people call gauge group in computer science, which is not such a great terminology, I just call G. And this is the group of checks. And this is not necessarily a billion. And the center of this group is this AH. So this is a standard mathematical thing called central extension. But I want this extension to be very special, which is called split, which means abstractly this G is basically a product of this A and another piece, which is the full poly group of some qubits. And I claim this is roughly the structure of a subsystem code. And the, the reason this is a subset, this is like in mathematics, we are very careful to distinguish something called a property versus a structure. So when I say this is a group, when I say a billion group, that's a property, it's just special. When I say it's a new group, that's with extra structure, which is called topology. And that's the sense of subspace is special subsystem code because subsystem codes are just, you put more structure onto a single subspace, like a potential product or the central extension. If you are physicist, you should think this way. The subspace code is the ground state of a Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian is just this generative set of this stabilizer group. 
and then you should consider G as the symmetry of your Hamiltonian. That's because this is the center, so this commute everything in the checks, so the check a symmetry of this Hamiltonian. And when you have a symmetry of a Hamiltonian, and the ground state is a representation of the symmetry group. And then this closed subspace is a representation of your check group. And it turns out this representation decomposed into a tensor product that this G acts trivially on V and acts <coughs> as the full poly <coughs> on D. So that's the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that's the subsystem code. And you can <coughs> see that subspace is a special case if this D is one dimensional. And then this is the trivial up to scalars, really. And then these two groups are the same, and that's give you back subspace with code. And then <coughs> it comes for the K code. So I want to say that if I have a theory, I want for the K code to be extra structures of subspace code. Now what's this extra structure will be? This will be non-trivial time dynamics. I want to consider subspace and the subsystem that is the most difficult thing to achieve, which is you want to stay the same. I think we will, we all want to stay the same. That's really hard. So it's really the constant evolution case of Flaquet code. And in the Flaquet code, you have non-trivial dynamics. And that sense, which is this subset is. So I consider Flaquet code as extra structure of quantum dynamics, which is time dependent time dependent. And uh, the subject uh, started with histone hard code, which is, I will tell you the next slide, which is called the Honeycomb code. And then I will mainly tell you a work I did with Dave Asen and Matt, <coughs> which is we call automorphous code, <coughs> or actually we call Asen code in private. <laughs> so, uh, but I want to see the beautiful history of this thing, the Honeycomb code the history according to what Matt told me was he was thinking about this volume law versus area law in monitored random quantum dynamics. And there we know it's no error correction property. So he wondered if you do a really careful schedule for measurement, would you get error correction property? The answer is yes, not only error correction property, it's correct you can do four tolerant quantum computation. And even better than that, the actual threshold is really big. <clears throat> so that's the Honeycomb code. And then Matt, Dave, and I, we try to understand this more mathematically, and we think you can construct more examples using topological symmetries of any model. So that's what I'm going to tell you. And uh, so I claim this is really a property of a modulized space which is you give me a top particle order, you can ask the modulized space of all the Hamiltonians which realize this top particle order. And it turns out this space has lots of topology. And I claim the Flaquet code is close related to the fundamental group. So we'll see this in the last few slides. As I said, you know, stop me for any question. Okay, so this is my general perspective on, I hope there will be a theory of Flaquet code and uh, I do leave some dot, dot, dot. And uh, I think you will hear at least two talks this morning. There are more examples from Ben and Dom about examples of Flaquet code. And hopefully eventually some kind of framework will come up and uh, we can make it into a better theory. And at this stage, we are still thinking about examples. So now I want to tell you the famous Honeycomb code, at least at the Microsoft. And uh, so this is Honeycomb code. So you have to have the Honeycomb lattice. And let's think this of the torus, just make things easier. And then we want to three color all the plaquettes, zero, one, two, or RGB, whatever you want to call. So we have three colors of the plaquettes of the Honeycomb lattice on the torus. And then I, it's not I, it's Matt and Zhu Wang, Notice that once you have three colors of the plaquette, you can have nine different colors of each edge. And the nine is three by three. First, 
each edge, if you extend a little bit, will touch to plaquette. And that's your induced color of the edge. So you get a zero, one, two, which is a round label. And then just because of honeycomb, you have an X, Y, Z direction, you just call one direction X, the other Y, the other Z. It doesn't matter, just call them X, Y, Z. So now each edge, you have nine labels. And you want your qubit to be on the vertices. This is slightly different from Tori code. It's on the vertices. And then this gives you the local Hilbert space. And now the histing hard code is very simple. You have your qubit on the vertices, and you have your nine labels on the edges, and now you just run the following. You take the label 0, 1, 2 of the edge as a round label, and then you just measure in rounds, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, just continue. And uh, each round, when you measure, say, zero round, zero round, and that means you measure all the zero edges. So here's one. And uh, there are two qubits at the end of this edge. And then you look at the direction. This is the y direction. So you measure y, y at the two end points. Okay. And you take another zero edge. And uh, this is horizontal. So this is the z. So you measure z, z here for the two qubits. And they just measure 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, and just continue. And then when you measure, you have to have a classical memory to keep track of all the measurement results. So they keep a log and all the measurement results. And then the claim is this log, by reading it, you will figure out if there's an error, and if there's an error, how do I fix it? And what I'm telling you right now is just part of memory. There's no operation yet. Just I can fix errors. So that's the Hasting hard code. You just measure 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, and then you read your book. So uh, this is actually kind of ideal for Microsoft. Because at the Microsoft, we try to build a Majorana quantum computer. It's measurement-based. And this is the least you have to do, which is two-body measurement. So this only have two-body measurement. And uh, it has lots of other beautiful properties. For example, if you want to do measurement-based Majorana quantum computation, if you just adapt the surface code onto measurement-based, you get an accurate threshold like a 0.15%. And this one has accuracy threshold from 0.8 to 1.5%. And also the layout is much, much simpler for Majorana using this code. So this is basically a perfect match for our uh, Majorana platform. So this is the uh, Hastings hard code. Of course, if you want to do fancy things, you have to do lattice surgery. You do this kind of standard magic state distillation. But that also can be done. So, uh, so this is the Honeycomb code. And uh, something which actually really annoyed Matt at the first place is that if you really want to do quantum computation, you need to this put on the plan. If you try to do the planner situation, there's something really annoying, which is this has some kind of non-trivial dynamics in terms of logical operator. So what it is is the following. So if you measure four round, zero, one, two, zero, and you get a bunch of eigenvalue plus or minus one, and Tori code is very special. It doesn't matter ground state or excited state. So let's focus on the ground state. So suppose you all get one. And then the claim is this subspace inside this L can be regarded as a Tori code, not on the original lattice, but on a emerged super lattice. So what it is is that once you've done four round and you assume this is a mathematical terminology without lots of generality. <laughs> so if all part, you know, plus one eigenvalue, and then what you will get is that you get a super lattice, which is also honeycomb, which is you basically delete the zero, and then you do the dual of the left uh, plaquette uh, label by one, two. And then you can see that each time you measure an edge, you collapse two, two qubits into one qubit. So that's the uh, 
the measurement give you. And then that means if this two qubit on this edge, it's really become one qubit on this dual edge. So therefore you can imagine there's a toric code on this super lattice. And then you can identify the end of the full round as the ground state of toric code. And then as you continue to measure one, two, zero, one, two, all you are doing is that there are three different super lattices, and each super lattice has a toric code on it. You're just doing a cycle. You're just moving this toric code, not on the original lattice, on this super lattice. And after three rounds, something very interesting happens. The EM called your particle in toric code got exchanged. And if you, I assume many people know, there's a one EM and an epsilon in the toric code, and the EM symmetry is a famous uh, version of electrical magnetic duality. So after three rounds, you will change, implement this symmetry. And this turns out, screw you if you want to put on the plane. You have to change the schedule. But so it was an annoying thing for Matt at the first. But now we want to claim this is the defining property of a flicker code. Instead of an annoying signature, this is actually the defining property of a flicker code. So that's basically I want to tell you, which is in this original honeycomb code, you just really have a triangle with the three vertices. There are three toric code on super lattice. And now if you just do a easy uh, interpretation, you can get a loop of uh, Hamiltonians or ground state. And this implement a non-trivial symmetry in toric code. And I want to generalize this to symmetries of any NER models. And then from there, we can build more examples of we call automorphic code. So I want to uh, tell people about liberal symmetries of any model. Uh, so I assume people most know uh, any model. So this is just that you have some any they have fusion rule, they can breed with each other. So obviously a symmetry would be a map from your any ions to any ions, and then uh, preserve the structure. And the mathematical Definition is an NER model is a unitary modular tensor category, and a symmetry is a braided tensor functor, which from this unitary modular tensor to itself. And if you take them into classes, and they will form a group. If you don't take classes, more interesting, I will mention later, that's a categorical group. But if you take equivalent class using natural transformation, that's make it a group. And this group has another way to explain it. And uh, this is what I'm going to use it, which is this group, which is the uh, automorphism of any models, is isomorphic to another group, which is called Picard group. So this is the group of invertible gap domain walls in your theory. And it's very easy to see physically in cartoon how this would go to there. So suppose you have a gap domain wall. And here's your topological phase of matter B. And here's your domain wall. And now suppose you have an any on the left. And now you push across the domain wall. As you push, this will get pushed. Domain wall get pushed, it's topological. And then if you look at here, because this is a invertible domain wall, so that means this guy which goes to the right and this one goes to the left are inverse of each other. So they cancel. So therefore, when you push through, what happens your anion is wrapped inside the domain wall. And that's your functor. And there's a mathematical theorem that's actually give you isomorphic of the Picard group with the definition using functors. And for Tory code, the group is Z2, it's generated by E and M. So now I want to explain a little bit of how to go from symmetry to a loop of Hamiltonian. And I take the definition of a symmetry as a invertible domain wall, and now I want to use the domain wall to construct a family, a path of Hamiltonian. How do you do it? So I will talk a little bit about math, but the picture tell you exactly what it is. So you have a manifold, you have a top particle phase of matter on it, and then you give your manifolds a handle decomposition. And then you have zero handle, which are the dots. And then you're just using the gap 
domain wall to write a Hamiltonian so that this boundary of the zero handle becomes the gapped boundary. And then you do one handle, same thing, and then you do the two handle, and if n manifolds you go to the n handle, and then you pump the whole domain wall through the whole system, and this gives you a symmetry of your theory. And so that's how you construct from a gapped domain wall to a parameter family of Hamiltonian. And there's a inverse map, which people know probably better than me. This is a generalization of what Kitaev did for uh, SPT. And you can also define the inverse map, which I won't use it. So that means from a loop of Hamiltonian, you can go back to a gapped domain wall. So now I want to explain to you the EM automorphic code, or we call async code in private. So uh, this is pretty much a analog of the Honeycomb code, except there's some variations and which are different. So uh, as I already explained, symmetries of any R model leads to loops of Hamiltonian by pumping domain walls. And then I want to explain to you this error which goes to Flaquet codes. And for Torrey code, there are two symmetries, the trivial one and the interesting one. If you do the construction for the trivial one, you should just get a static you know, Torrey code. There's nothing interesting. And I want to focus on the EM automorphic code. So I still have the Honeycomb lattice. And I do the same thing, three color or the plaquette. And then I will put qubit, the way I draw is, what they draw is that we have a thickened edges, we have thin ones. I want to imagine that on the thick, on the thinner one, there's a qubit. And on the thick ones, it's really a one degree freedom. It's a dead qubit. And uh, what we want to do for this code is that, again, you just run measurement in run the 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, just continue. And at around 0, you go to the 0 plaquette. I think actually the picture I drew is me for the 2 plaquette. It's a little bit hard to read, but I think easy to explain. So you go to see the 0 plaquette, and then there are qubits on the edge of this, uh, Okay, I think I, I started with two. And so there are six qubit here, and we run this circuit. Uh, I know it's a little bit hard to read at the back, but I can easily say what it is. And we call this a Kramer's one circuit. I'll explain next. And then the circuit you run is that all the six qubit, first you change the basis using Hardmore. And then you measure z, which means you kill three. Actually, sorry, I should back up a little bit. I said it's that. Thinner, but actually the model started with all qubits. So at the beginning, they're still alive. And you run this H hardmar on each of them to change the basis. And then you measure Z on the even ones. So that's kill them, make them dead. And then you run X in pairs, and then you run Z in pairs, and you, re you shift one side. And then you kill the other three qubits, the, the, the complement three qubit. If you run this circuit on all the plaquettes with the label zero, and then label one, and then label two, and then you do the same thing. You keep track of this 12 measurement outcome as a log, and that gives you uh, this code. And uh, it's really, really similar. And after a cycle, you can see a Tory code on a super lattice which is you take all the zero plaquette, you can draw this big triangle, and that's give you a triangle lattice, and then this just give you the code subspace is identified with the Tori code on this emergent triangular lattice. So that's our EM code. And why I call that thing a Cramius Warner circuit, and that's exactly the analog of in condensed matter physics. So if you measure, remember the circuit start with the change of basis, then kill three qubits, suppose you do this already, and then you have this picture of three color of the plaquette, and there's some dead qubit, and there's some alive qubit. And then what you can do is, you can go to a plaquette with three alive, three dead, and you can, for those who know the NER model, if not, I'm really, you know, authority to use this thing, but this is exactly what it is. 
So the qubit has a basis, and you identify with the i's in any on one side. And the that qubit is one degree freedom, you identify with the i's in any on sigma. And then, in a loop, you draw a sigma loop of any on, and then you fuse this loop onto the boundary. As you do this, depends on the measurement outcome, you will get a version of cranium one or duality in statistical mechanical physics. And if you write this into measurement, two-body measurement, and that's exactly the circuit we got here. And I want to point out the one difference between this and the, auto, and the honeycomb code. And the honeycomb code, if you remember, you have to measure x, x, y, y, z, z. And here, we don't measure y, y. So if you have a platform of a measurement beta quantum computation, and this code has the advantage, you don't need to measure y, y. All you need to do is x, x, z, z. So, so this is how we got it. And uh, I think I'm OK on time. I won't really tell you the details about how to generalize for the double to all quantum doubles. And I'm also not happy with uh, the way we did it. So I will just be quick. So uh, Perry code is a quantum double. And uh, if you have a quantum double, it means it's the Dreamfield center of a fusion category. And if you take a domain wall, which means a symmetry of the NER model, and you can form this uh, kind of like a G cross category. And then you will form a Hilbert space, which is the degree of freedom is the number of NERs plus the number of defect. And you put on the Honeycomb lattice. And then you can write down a Hamiltonian, but the first thing you need to do is you need to, uh, remember in the Tory code case, uh, we have like a active, active qubit or dead qubit. You have to do this preparation and then you can do the same kind of math to, uh, you know, pump your domain wall onto the boundary of a plaquette and then you will get a, a, a code. So the uh, Hamiltonian we are using in the paper is the uh, level one Hamiltonian for those who know. But I want to point out the level one Hamiltonian has a defect for this application. So remember the level one Hamiltonian, if you uh, have seen it, there are two kinds of terms. There's a vertex term, there's a plaquette term. And the Hamiltonian is written sequentially. You implement the vertex term and then the plaquette term. And that's how it's written. So it's not kind of like, you know, independently. And that's actually a little bit inconvenient for you to write down as a code. So in this particular situation, the Kitaev Hamiltonian is much better. If you write out the quantum double for Kitaev model, it does not need to first do the vertex and then do the plaquette. So in order for this application, actually you need to do two extensions of the level one model. One is you want them not to be sequentially. And that's this dangling bond is about. You absorb this fusion rule violation into this dangling bond. And uh, so that's uh, one variation. Another variation extension is that if you think about flaket code, it's kind of topological phase of matter with some kind of a fixed classical background. And this is kind of the preparation step. So you really need two extension of the level one model for this application. And personally, uh, I really think it's better to use generalized Kitaev model to replace a finite group with any weak half algebra. And that's like exactly equivalent or due to uh, the level one model. But uh, I don't think this has been done. My student wrote a thesis on this, but it's not the application. So for the last minute or two, I want to say what I think this like code uh, reflects. So as I mentioned already, if you give me a top particle order, at least an NER model, you can study the space of Hamiltonians who realize this top particle order. And for convenience, I will module all the Hamiltonians which realize the invertible top particle order. And that's actually a vibration. So you can ask, you know, what is the topology of this space? And you might wonder, do they really have topology? Yes. You know, a paper we wrote down a explicit loop of Hamiltonian, which is non-trivial because it realized the EM automorphism. 
So uh, I want to claim this space is something should be well known, which is called the classifying space of the symmetry group. Instead of group, I need to be a little bit mathematical, it's a categorical group. So what it is, is it take an annual model like Tory code. As I said, you take functors, preserve the, uh, the annual structure. And don't make equivalence class, just take them as objects. A basic form of two group. And uh, just as any group has a classifying space, which is the one which classify principal bundles, there are generalizations of classifying space for categorical groups. So we can write down a categorical group. I use the uh, bold face to show this is categorical. And then I claim the space of Hamiltonian is basically, this is a conjecture, we cannot prove anything. The space of Hamiltonian basically is a classifying space of this categorical group. So uh, for those who don't know much topology, you know, basically the way classifying space is defined is that you know you have an action on some contractible space, and then the quotient is your classifying space. And you can see the action already here. You have a space of Hamiltonian. That's your space. And the symmetry of the anion model acting on this space in the sense that it's a symmetry of a phase of matter. So you don't need to send the Hamiltonian back to the cell. All you need to send is the Hamiltonian represent the same topological phase. So there is kind of an action already there. And I just claim this actually serves as the classifying space of this categorical symmetry group. And uh, if you, I don't know how to prove this. I think this is a far from proven because the definition of this space is extremely complicated. But you can easily try to understand their homotopic group and the consequence of this. So uh, I claim the Fleke code is a reflection of the fundamental group of this space. And finally, I want to uh, advertise my favorite problem. <laughs> so as a mathematician, a large part of our job is to classify things, things that are interesting to us. I think topological code, which I think approximately the same thing as topological order, is an interesting structure to classify. So now you can ask the question, how do you classify them? And in mathematics, we know normally what we do. We find something called complete environment. And actually, in order for you to have a theory people are interested, the complete environment has to be good in some sense. So what complete means? Complete means that this thing completely determines the thing. And everything has one complete environment, which is the definition. But nobody would use the definition to classify things. So you want to use something else. And normally a complete environment is always bad because it's very complicated. So you want an environment good in the sense of easy to calculate and easy to understand. So what a good example for those who study any models. The modular data is a beautiful, good environment. Unfortunately, it is not complete. <laughs> so my hope is that this space of Hamiltonian topological phase of matter you can derive a little bit of beyond modular data. If you throw this into the modular data, that would be complete for any model. I think I will stop here, and thanks for listening. Uh, thanks, Jacob, for the nice talk. Could I ask if you could explain a bit more about the conjecture? So I think I see this pi one is related to these paths you described, but why should the higher pi n's match? Yeah, yeah, okay, uh, let me back to this. So uh, let me treat, I know you, so uh, you are not a mathematician. Let me first tell you the classifying space business. So the standard example of a classifying space is the classifying space of the integers is the circle. So you have a sequence of uh, Z acting on R and goes to the circle. So uh, the circle is the classifying space of integers. Now this is a contractible space. So this sequence turns into uh, G, EG, and BG. So in order for you to define the classifying space, 
All you need is, if you give me a group, you want to define this class and find space in the classical sense, you need to find a contractible space. Your group acts on it freely, no fixed point. And then the quotient would be your class and find space. I think physics has a beautiful explanation. The class and find space is a space that each point has a G symmetry. It's a G equivalent point. So what I conjecture or we conjecture in the paper, but I want to say I because I feel like there's a chance to be wrong, so I should be responsible. <laughs> so in the paper, we conjecture basically the space of Hamiltonians realize a particular topological order is the categorical version of a BG. And this G is the categorical symmetry of the Anion model. What is missing is what is E G. Like I'm really pondered about that. Apparently, I think the Hamiltonian is not the whole story. There should be something. So that's our conjecture. Modulo invertible topological order. And then the BG is only defined up to homotopy. So it's only, it's only unique up to homotopy equivalence. And therefore, the first interesting environment would be all the homotopy group. So if this is a version of, you have to have the same homotopy group. So that's what I'm saying. And for those who know classifying space, this is a K pi one. I only have pi one and a pi two above a zero. And that's why we need a categorical classifying space. Then you can have non trivial pi two, pi three, and it turns out pi four above is also zero. I hope that's explained. Can I ask one follow up? Is there a nice physical picture for what the higher pi's should be? That would be really interesting. Actually, I think actually, I don't know. I, uh, you ask the high home to group, right? I don't know. I think for the physicists in the audience, it would be very interesting to see if there's any physical response for the high homotopy group. And they do exist. Pi 2 is non trivial. So pi 1 is the group of invertible domain modes, and pi 2 for any more is all the abelian anions in your model. So for Tori code, it's Z2 plus Z2. There are lots of them. And the question is, are there a physical response? I'm pretty sure there's a physical response. I just don't know. Okay, thanks. Um, so you said towards the beginning um, that you wanted the EM transformations at the boundary to be a definition of the floquet rather than just a feature of the... Can, can you say a bit more about why you want that to be a definition? Okay, so uh, if I have, you know, everything done mathematically, I would do the following. So you take a subset code, and then you define what is the symmetry group of the subsystem code. It's basically along the line of a QCA or something. So if you have a symmetry group, and then I think potentially it's not unique, give me any symmetry, you can try to realize as a path of Hamiltonian. And then it depends on how you discretize the path and how you realize by circuit. I would think that's the essence of at least those from topology, which is basically a dynamical periodic realization of the symmetry of your code. And uh, I think what I was talking about is one specific example of a topological physical matter, which all those are pretty well understood, any other models. All right, so I, I wanted to maybe raise the opportunity to connect to some things that we've studied that seem very similar. Uh -huh. So uh, in the context of studying floquet phases of unitary dynamics, we encountered almost all of these features. Like uh, you could, you know, floquet and rich topological orders also seem to be classified by any on automorphisms. Uh, we kind of understand the EM changing duality, messing up the boundary in terms of some formal uh, fermion QCA classification. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I just wanted. To, they seem very superficially similar. I don't know if they're I, exactly I agree the with, same I, or. I completely agree with you. Uh, there's some connection, probably not superficial, probably deep, but I don't. Maybe Matt can comment afterwards. I don't think it's obviously how they are related, so I can tell you. So my understanding of the case phase of matter, or you call the case topological phase of matter, 
it's an integer protected topological order. And it's also a space symmetry, space time symmetry. Uh, so in a sense, if you gauge that symmetry, probably will turn into some kind of Lacky code. And the classification is superficially similar or maybe the same. But I think there's a translation to be done. And also there, you are talking about a loop of states, which are the eigenstates of this Flaky unitary. Well, well, not necessarily states, right? I mean, people have studied loops of, of entire Hamiltonians. That, 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 that you know, I, I, I definitely see there should be a deep connection, but I just don't know how to pin down. For that reason, I don't even know what a Flaky code is. But I think there is a connection between Flaky phase of matter and a Flaky code, but they are not identical. Thanks. Hi, Fiona. Hi, sorry. Um, so I, I just wanted to understand, so the construction that you gave at the beginning of, you know, how you sort of pump these domain walls through, in principle, you didn't have to pick the domain walls to be invertible, right? So you could have some cycle with, like, non-invertible domain walls. And I guess I was wondering, you know, that seems like it's probably not such a good idea for building a code, but I was wondering if you could comment on that and whether it's interesting and why or why not. Well, I can used to say it's more than interesting. I spent the last few years trying to understand what that means. I just don't have anything not trivial to say. I think, personally, I think, uh, Group symmetry in physics has probably gone to some limit. We don't get much out of it. And I think really probably the next symmetry should be this kind of non-invertible domain wall symmetry. But I just don't know how to do anything concrete to show the power. And I agree probably it's not easy to make into a code, but uh, there are definitely something in between of invertible domain walls and the general domain walls, which are extremely interesting as a symmetry of any model. I can give you an example, which is you take any any model, the invertible domain wall corresponding to you have a bunch of bosons which are condensable, bosonic object, ref G. And condensable algebra, we actually Ben will talk about this. Condensable algebra is more than ref G. And if you condense anything not wrap G of a finite group, that will give you a non-invertible domain wall. And that's for whatever reason I believe is the symmetry of the annual model. What to do with it, I don't know. Thanks. Okay, uh, let's uh, thank Ken for the interesting talk. Thanks.